Thank you for joining us. Uh, Holbrook Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, How to Be a Successful Group Leader and Travel Free. We're pleased to be joined by two of our Holbrook Travel Specialists, Debbie Sturdivant Jordan and Lisa Palmisi Grabard, uh, along with one of our expert group leaders, Ron Farb. Uh, so just briefly, I'll go over uh, uh, the agenda for today. Uh, Debbie will be kicking it off with a uh, quick overview on tips for uh, group leader success. So if you are interested in leading a group travel uh, program or maybe if you've led one in the past and looking for tips on how to uh, be successful again in the future, uh, she'll be giving some, some really good interesting information on that. And then after Debbie's presentation, we'll open it up for a panel discussion with Debbie and Lisa and Ron. Uh, real quick, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, Debbie Sturdivant Jordan is a specialty travel consultant with Holbrook Travel. She has been a uh, travel consultant since 2001. She has a passion for travel, nature, and boating, and she has sailed from California to Florida and spent time in Costa Rica, Panama, and the Galapagos, and she has traveled to more than 35 countries. Uh, Lisa Palmisi Graubard is also a travel consultant with Holbrook Travel. Uh, Lisa has visited 17 countries uh, and her travels have included swimming with sea lions and being in the middle of a herd of wild elephants. She loves spending time with her family and doing anything that involves being in and around water. And Lisa has been with Holbrook Travel since 1990. Uh, and then we also have Ron Farb joining us. He is a group leader uh, for Holbrook Travel and co-founder of the Climb for Cancer Foundation. Uh, Ron Farb was educated at the College of William and Mary and he is a former military aviator. Ron has traveled to every continent and more than 50 countries around the world. He has climbed the highest mountain on five of the seven continents, including Everest, Aconcagua, Denali, Elbrus, and Kilimanjaro. And he has raised more than $1.5 million to fund medical research for cancer with Climb for Cancer, a foundation that he began in 2002 with his wife, Diane. And he was winner of the 2014 Heart of the Community Award. So now I'm going to turn it over to Debbie so that she can uh, give us a little bit more information on uh, what it's like to be a group travel leader. So Debbie, welcome. Thanks, Lindsay. And hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Today we're going to be talking about being a successful group leader. And I'm really excited to be part of this webinar that's going to help both our veteran travelers as well as potential new group leaders. Some of you joining us may have already traveled as leaders so you might be interested in hearing about other people's experiences. But I know that some of you are also thinking about making the jump from being a participant to a group leader. So we're just going to share some of the tips with you and uh, some of the benefits of leading a group and how to ensure your trip goes smoothly and also get you fired up about going out into the field. If you're brand new, please be sure to contact me or one of our other consultants on how to get started planning your trip. Um, in the last 15 years, I have worked with hundreds of successful leaders to bring their schools and universities and organizations on special interest travel programs around the world. And I've also learned from a lot of personal experience that you really have to be prepared and invest in a lot of personal energy and time taking on um, some quite a bit of responsibility. I think it's not a tremendous amount of responsibility, but the benefits far outweigh a little bit of extra work that you have to do. Uh, free travel is really nice and uh, the main thing I think though is travel is so life-changing and meeting some of these people that go on these programs and sharing the world's cultures with them and um, potentially raising funds for your organization and building affinity among your members is just, oh, that's just a few of the great benefits that come along for, with uh, organizing and leading a trip. So uh, the free word, a uh, word about traveling free. So we are, um, uh, by doing this job of being the US organizer, you have to know that your in-country guide really is the one that is doing the interpretation. They're knowing the birds, they know the culture and the history, and you're kind of um, more of a, I would like to say, a cheerleader or a den mother or father kind of um, being sort of looking after everybody like a, like a mother hen. So um, you're obviously uh, have some responsibilities in getting the travelers to join the trip, which we can help on that. And your cost is generally covered. That includes your flights from your home city. 
Um, but as it mentions here at the bottom, you can opt to um, either use that money that would have gone towards your, tra you know, towards your travel to either or lower the price for the participants or um, make more money for your organization. So um, we also do combinations. Some organizations, you know, the leader pays for their own flights, and the, and the land cost is built into the into the trip cost. So next slide, Lindsay. So marketing is a pretty key thing. You have to um, you have to put some energy out here, but it's not a tremendous amount of energy because we do a lot of it for you. We will produce professional looking flyers and our websites are awesome. They have lots of great information about the countries and um, there's a place right there where people click so they can they can join the trip right online and just put in their credit card and be able to um, receive updates uh, information through through our um, online portal that we have available for people now to be able to make payments and and um, potentially um, you know get good information for, through their portal. Um, also, you're going to want to be communicating a lot, you know, to your partic potential participants through email and also through social media and everywhere you can get the word out. One of our wonderful leaders um, from the Chicago area, she takes her flyers with her to the gym. She, Everybody she meets, she's like, oh, you want to go to Galapagos? Oh, you want to go with me to Peru? So you always are um, wanting to spread the word out to, you know, maybe other organizations if you're an Audubon chapter, you might want to reach out to um, other chapters in your region or state that would help um, send people into your into your trip. So we do everything we can to help you out. Next slide, yeah. So once you have your participants on board, you definitely want to be in touch with them as uh, you want to get that excitement, the, the pre-trip information is something that is is always really good um, you know obviously recruiting is is important but building the the group community before you even leave is also a lot of times people may know each other but not always so it's good to have like a, a meeting before you go so people can um, exchange you know just if you're in the same city you know get together uh, but you can also do it virtually through um, you know, through Skype or other types of, of communication. Um, one of the other things at the top bullet that I skipped over is that you we can also set up a meeting with your in-country guide prior to your departure. That makes, I think it's really good for both parties. It, it gives you the, feel, the confidence that you've already met your, the person that's going to be guiding you in Costa Rica or wherever you're traveling. And they also get a chance to know you a little bit as well. So again, trying to stay in touch with people prior to the trip, I think is it's a it's a good key uh, tip for um, for success. So the next slide is talking about your in-country guide, and that person is your partner. They are really usually the one that is makes or breaks the trip. You know, if you have a guide that doesn't have the enthusiasm and which you're not going to get that with Holbrook. Our guides are amazing. All of them are we hold guide trainings and they're very, very good with people. They have um, just amazing personalities and some of them we've been working with for 20 plus years. It's it's just amazing that how um, how we've all grown together here. So one of the main um, one of the questions I often get the the, the bullet on the, the bottom bullet on the left is you know what does it mean about taking an authoritative role you know some people have never traveled on a group before they've never traveled you know with with nine or ten other people and they just they don't understand you know you need to show up on time you need there are other you have to be considerate of the other group members and sometimes you get somebody that doesn't really get that and um that's really your responsibility to talk with them and you know not read them out or anything like that but you know just to mention that 
maybe you know to to try to show up on time because it's just out of consideration to the rest of the folks on the group and um so your guide again they're they're very sensitive they um are watching people as well that you should be keeping an eye to to make sure that people are are um you know understanding the guide that's one thing that can come up you know if if people can't understand a, a foreign accent sometimes so you know you might want to speak to the guide and say you know slow down a little bit because people are having a, a difficult time uh, understanding some of the words that you're saying so again that's not that common but it's just something to be aware of it's one of the issues that can come up so then um, the next thing of course we always do make safety the number one priority on all of our groups and I think I mentioned I, I should mention that you know when you get your final packet and and when you're just you know, focusing on the fact, oh gosh, we're leaving here in a, a week or two, uh, it's time to start getting organized. It's really important for you to be organized. You, some people I know have a notebook and they've got everything. I, I've done this myself and it really helps to have all of your vouchers handy. You have, um, you know, take your leader manual along with you if, if you feel like you um, haven't had a chance to digest all those good tips in there. Um, just really to, to be organized is, is going to make you look good to your group. Also, it's going to make you feel the confidence that you need to project, you know, that that you have everything under control. Next slide. So while you're in the field, each night it's a good idea to meet with your guide, have a, you know, just to go over the next day's activities. And, you know, most guides, well, of course, in front of the group, they're going to say, you know, tomorrow you need to bring this in your pack because we're going on this kind of a hike, or, you know, they're they're going to give that information to you uh, as a group. But you, again, want to be, you know, just be sure that everybody understands because they don't listen. <laughs> People don't listen. You can you can tell them and they nod their heads and then. You know, the next morning, well, Jane didn't show up at 6.30 because, well, she thought it was 7.30. So um, the last note here, too, is something to be aware of is that people with a hearing impairment, uh, you know, I've had it just on a recent trip where the lady, she would turn around and ask the same question that the guide had just told everyone. And, and so, you know, maybe she should sit closer to the guide or something like that so that, that she can hear and understand what they have to say. So um, next slide. So all right. Lots of times you might be thinking you're getting a lot of silly questions from people and you know you just always have to take everything with a grain of salt and continue just be positive. You know if you go into this with a positive attitude and and the caring, um, the caring, what's the tra the trait of of being um, caring about your participants and making sure they're having a good time. Question them, you know, ask them if there's something that you can do to help them. That's really your job is to be just to be sensitive to people's needs. And um, difficult people is something too that often will happen. It seems like every group sort of has one of those people and so you know just to be kind and and I've seen groups get kind of you know like oh that woman she's such a pain and you know you just have to keep up the the happy spirit and try to get get uh, keep people from getting cranky so our next one so again, this positive attitude is a huge, huge difference in, in the, it's the main difference that you can make. In our booklet, it has a case study about a couple of groups that were in the Maasai Mara one year, and it just stormed like crazy. And the, you know, they couldn't go out on safari. The vehicles got stuck. You know, it was just a disaster. I mean, it could have been a disaster. The one group, the leader was just 
oh my gosh, we paid good money. We shouldn't have to go through this and blah, you know, went on. And of course, it gets very contagious with, you know, the group leader really sets the tone for the whole group. And if you're going to be all upset and negative, well, guess what? All your people are going to be all upset and negative. And in the case of this this particular case study, they, the other group, you know, they took pictures of how the sky was getting black and just watching the animals, how they were reacting, and really just relishing the opportunity to see something that's out of the ordinary. You know, so stuff happens, and, you know, it's just making the best of it. And it just reminds me of a story, too, one of our longtime leaders, Marilyn Lazowski. She had a group. She's done a lot of trips, I think, for the, like, the last 40 years, and she had a group in the Amazon one year they all got there but their luggage didn't and they were in such a remote place that they wound up having to wear the same clothes for like a week and the whole group they came up with some really funny and inventive things like you know inside out day and then you know they they did stuff like um washing each other with their clothes on so they got their clothes washed you know and having these competitions and so, you know, they just turned it into a, a big funny joke. And, uh, you know, it's it's that kind of thing that makes the memories that we all can talk about on, you know, the stories that you take back from travel. That's that's the biggest takeaway. And these crazy things that can happen really can turn into these great stories. So just always keep that in mind if um, something unexpected happens. So number eight. Um, so read this great manual that you're going to be getting, and it is, um, it's full of tons of tips there with all of, you know, the combined years of experience the, from our leaders and our staff that people have, um, you know, encountered a lot of different things in the field. And um, the other thing you can do, too, you, if you have questions, just call me or call one of our other consultants, and we're happy to help. So to recap, so the first thing, um, get your marketing going out early, send out those social media um, posts you want to, uh, you might want to uh, set up a marketing plan. We can help you figure that out. If um, you know, One thing I've learned is you have to tell people over and over and over again about the trip because otherwise they might have missed it in the newsletter or whatever and then later on they discover that they came on too late. They you know, they, we don't want that to happen. So then um, you want to stay in touch with your folks. Uh, once they're on board, do your homework before you go. Be a partner with your in-country guide. That person is, um, is your valuable asset. You're the boss of the trip, but that person is, is really the one that is, um, is obviously delivering all of the, the good information to the to the participants and to you. Um, number five, hold the daily re briefing and be repetitive, just as I said, because people miss things and they don't, they're not listening or whatever. Then we have uh, monitoring your group dynamics and, you know, watch, see if people are showing you body language or, um, you know, saying things that, that maybe, you know, by speaking kindly with them might, might help change things. And then approach positive, approach with Approach everything with a positive attitude. Can't go wrong doing that. And then, again, digest that leader manual and ask us questions, and you'll be off to a great success. We're here to support you. Great. Well, thank you, Debbie, so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your insight on all of that. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we are going to open it up now for a panel discussion. Uh, and if you do have questions that you'd like to submit, you can submit those in your control panel. Uh, you can just type it in the questions pane. Uh, you'll type it in and click send, and those questions will be sent to us so that we can share them with our panelists. Um, so to kick it off, um, Debbie, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, one of the questions that we've received is asking about the responsibilities of a trip leader and specifically what are either the most important skills or what skills um, would be useful to have to be a group leader. So if you have a, a potential group leader coming to you and asking, you know, 
wanting to know if they may make a good group leader, um, what skills is, are helpful to have in the field? You want me to answer that one? Yeah, we'll, we'll have okay, you answer sure. and then you can I'll have some um, other panelists so, jump in. So yeah, the skills, I think patience is, I call it the three Ps. I live my life by this and it's the patience, perseverance, and, and persistence. And you know, you just, if you take everything in stride and you know these unexpected things that just having the calm about you is really really that's like so key and um, you know other than that just being kind and um, you know just be yourself people everyone brings something to the table and that's really what I love about group travel is you learn from the participants, you learn from the leaders, you learn from the guide. There's just a wonderful, wonderful exchange of, I, you know, of experiences and ideas. And I uh, don't know, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Lisa, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I think that, um, you know, each case uh, can be different and depends on what type of group. Um, you're leading, but I think, you know, what Debbie said kind of encapsulates um, the information. And I'm sorry that I'm scrambling here to come up with words. <laughs> That's all right. Um, let me ask you another question, Lisa. Um, do you have to have traveled to a destination prior to being a group leader for that particular destination? No, not at all. And a lot of the clients, and especially teachers and um, you know photographers, what um, drives their passion to try and um, leading trips is to go places that they haven't been before because they also want that experience. And that's where we come in in assisting you by educating you with information on the destination and how to prepare for it, what to expect. And we provide all the information that you need if, if, you know, a lot of times people will do their own research and then come back to me and say, well, you know, I heard about this community organization, um, you know, but I'm not familiar with it. Can you find more information? Uh, we, I personally, and I know my colleagues as well, love to do research and make sure that we're always offering um, whatever our leaders need. So definitely we're here to assist you and you do not have to be a visitor to that destination in order to um, make that first move. Great. Um, another question for you, Lisa. Uh, if someone comes to you interested in a specialized topic, so for example, geology or landforms, um, can you help them uh, either narrow down some destinations for them to work with or can you kind of help them find a destination or I guess how do you help them find the best destination for them? Definitely that is um, you know what we take great pleasure in doing with our clients and I think that I have learned so much about geology, ecology and so many other topics because I've had uh, leaders come to me and say I want to create a course or I want to offer this art program and these are the things I have in mind, um, you know, can, can you suggest destinations indefinitely? And if it's something that we don't know, we have a great team here, uh, average, you know, 15 to 20 years, and we have a great development team that ha goes out into the field a lot. So we have a lot of resources available, and um, including our in-country partners. So there hasn't been a topic yet that we haven't been able to deal with, including a kinesiology program, which <laughs> went very well in Costa Rica. Oh, so wow. I enjoy the challenge, and I, I think that our um, my colleagues do as well. So there is nothing that we aren't willing to try or look into. Great. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to welcome Ron Farb also. Um, Ron, thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess sort of on a on a related topic, can I ask you how do how have you chosen the destinations that you've traveled to with Holbrook in the past? Well, my travel is mostly adventure travel. Um, I certainly offer uh, other options, but it's mostly adventure travel, and I like to go to um, 
the destinations where um, they have the opportunity to get out uh, into the wilderness. Um, <clears throat> my trips to uh, Peru and Patagonia um, and even Galapagos, you know, fit that bill so beautifully. Um, but I look for people that are not only interesting but interested. Uh, they want to um, go out of the box a little bit and um, experience something that they have not had an opportunity to do in the past, um, and just looking to expand their their horizon a little bit. Great, wonderful. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Debbie. Um, Debbie, if someone wants to, I, I think you maybe have touched on this a little bit in the presentation, but if someone wants to uh, connect with their in-country guide ahead of time and kind of introduce themselves and, and learn a little bit more about the person that they'll be working with uh, in country, is that something that Holbrook Travel can arrange? Yes, of course. And we generally do that um, probably around a month before travel. It, we can, once the guide is assigned, and generally the guide's we know that probably like two or three months before, so we could probably set it up, you know, within that time time frame once the guide has been assigned to your group. And okay. sometimes, you know, we're able to to request a guide and get, you know, someone that you might have had before. We always try to match folks up with the same guides if they've gone to the same country before. So that's one thing that we do pay attention to if you've been there before. And you liked a particular guide, we would we try to get you back together with them, so that really helps. But yes, we can do that um, prior to your departure. Great, uh, Ron. Can I ask you? Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences working with the in-country guides and and how you found that experience to be? Well, the guides that I've had on my trips uh, with Holbrook have been sensational, um, and you know. The, the beauty is that we become great friends. I communicate uh, with um, the guide that we've had in Patagonia, and um, and she's just become a dear friend. They're um, they're all very professional. They're all very highly educated, very knowledgeable about the the culture, uh, the uh, ecosystems in their country, the politics, uh, what have you, and um, and you know, I think that is one of the great things is that we're able to request um, those guides over and over again, and it really gives us a comfort level. Um, and I stress that to my clients that they're going to be meeting uh, somebody uh, that's you know going to make this trip very special. So it, it's been a great experience for me. Great, that's good to hear. Um, Lisa, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, can Holbrook's programs be customized um, and can they be part of a, a larger package that a leader is organizing if they're creating a, a more extensive trip? Is, can we take over part of that and help them with that? Well, we do have the abilities to customize. Uh, that's one of our specialties in meeting the needs of our clients like Ron with his adventure programs um, and you know doing doing different parts of Patagonia and also you know I've got people that come to me and want to focus on some of the cultures in Tanzania and so we can definitely work to customize the programs that being said um, you know when we have some really great tried and true programs that we have used for many years now, we tweak them every year, make improvements, um, work on suggestions that past clients and leaders have made. So we're always working to improve even our repeat programs. Um, so we always start with that and say, you know, what are your interests and your needs and this program might work great for you and then I might get someone that comes back and says, well, I really like that program but I would like to include a visit to a specific church to learn about, you know, um, you know how the importance of that church in this region. And then we can do some tweaks to it, but we are always open to um, starting with the set and we can expand from there. And we want every trip to meet the specific needs of the group and the leader. So that's what we strive to do. 
Okay. I would That's concur great. with that for sure. And if one of the things that we can, just because of our longevity and experience in these countries where we work, we have so many connections of our own, but we are we do have the ability to, for example, if I don't have worked with zoos that have gone down and and visited a, a project that one of their um, you know one of their staff was involved in, or a nonprofit that's gone to see where uh, you know they they supported an organization in in Costa Rica, for example. So they they actually went to the site to see the you know where their money went and how what what the community used to you know use the money to build like these platforms to to view some particular birds for example so the customization part is um, I think that's one of the things that we do very well and it really helps make our programs better and uh, better than our competition great uh, Debbie, we have someone who'd like to know, do leaders create the trips or do they lead trips that Holbrook has planned? So can you talk a little bit about uh, what the process is when someone comes to you who's interested in leading a trip, um, how how you will kind of walk them through that process? Sure, and Lisa just really gave kind of a good outline on it. Generally, the best way when you get started is to call us or set up a meeting so we can call you and uh, discover what it is you want to get out what are your what are the outcomes what are the objectives you have what you know do you want to go on a birding trip do you want to see a particular species or if you're a teacher are there particular themes that you want to focus on as, as Lisa mentioned so then we look at uh, you know where they want to go and um, and see if if one of our standard programs is suitable or something close to what they were expecting, give them some samples and, um, or, you know, if none of that satisfies what they want to do, you know, we can do a custom program. So, yes, what do we, we do customize. So that's, um, I, again, I think that's something that we do and we do well that not everyone out there does. Okay. And so you would say that, uh, that you work with group leaders uh, to create the trips, basically, whether they end up choosing uh, sort of a tried and true itinerary or customizing one, um, right. you work with group leaders to create those trips. Great. Right, yeah, I've had people that said, oh gosh, when I was in college, I went here and here and I really want to go back there, so yeah, sure, we can do that. Great. Um, Lisa, let me ask you, um, for someone who's interested in ideas on uh, ways to recruit participants or ways to recruit travelers for uh, a group, um, do you have any recommendations for that? Well, yes. Now, it, it, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Ron, for one, I know has a, a following and he's got some really adventurous friends and colleagues. So Ron um, likes to first start with um, and hand pick his participants because he has that possibility and and that's always an option for people that don't like for example I work with an artist who does a workshop in Costa Rica every year she has a e-news and she does online classes so she invites her students she markets in her e-news and she fills a lot of her trip but then Holbrook also puts it on our website. We, <coughs> excuse me, we help market it. We put it in our e-news. We put it up on our general program so that you don't have to be one of her students or someone following her to join the trip. And while Lisa's choking, I can um, jump in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey. <laughs> sorry, Lisa. Uh, I can jump in and say that you know we we can we definitely can help. We have people that come to our site looking to join programs. If you're open to that, that isn't the case with a lot of groups. They just are their own, you know, their own little entity. They want to keep it private. Only invite their board members or their uh, community, you know, their birding community or you know people that are just locally 
and, and not necessarily wanting to have it out as a public trip. So it can be done either way. It doesn't have to be publicly on the Holbrook site. You can have a private web page and, um, and not have it marketed to the general public or for them to be able to see it. Great. Um, Debbie, what role can social media play in promoting a trip? And I would add to that also if Ron, I don't know, Ron, if you have uh, used social media uh, for recruiting for your trips, but if you have, maybe you can talk about that as well. Yeah, you should. I mean, I'm really curious. Go ahead, Ron. Well, um, being an old timer, uh, social media is new to me. Uh, fortunately, my wife uh, does a great job with social media, but I realize how important it is and it, it really helps me um, reach out uh, to people. I mean, there's, you know, I have a finite amount of friends that, that like to do these trips. And without um, um, Facebook and, um, well, we don't use Twitter that much, but mostly Facebook, um, it's, really brought, yeah, it's really brought a lot of people uh, to my trips. And um, so I'm, I'm learning every day, and, but I do realize the importance of it and, um, and try to use it as much as possible. And I, I, I'm so thrilled to hear that because I'm one that hasn't jumped into the social media thing very well either, but I work with people and I've heard stories of others that it's just that, you know, a, a continuous engagement. You're every couple of weeks put something interesting up about the the country where you're going and you know you just have to keep it up in people's minds and uh, you know put a cool picture up there and that's the kind of thing that you know people on your that see your Facebook feed are going to say oh yeah I think I might just decide to do that so that's that's uh, it's something you, that you can plan out too so that you actually schedule yourself to post something and we can help give you content if, if you're if you're, you know, you want to put something about the volcanic eruption in Costa Rica or whatever country you're going to. It's basically the new way to expand word of mouth. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. We, we used to send out snail mail, and now we have the ability to reach people instantly. And um, and and it, I don't think that uh, I would be as successful in getting people signed up for these trips without social media. Great. Um, Debbie, uh, to kind of jump off of that as well, does Holbrook design marketing materials and ensure branding? Yes, we do. Um, ensure branding, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but are you saying I can actually jump completely in on that. behind the scenes? <laughs> yeah, I'll yes. actually jump in on that. On the uh, As far as ensuring branding, I will say that, yes, we can uh, work with your organization's branding guidelines. Um, so we can definitely help with creating um, uh, marketing materials, uh, everything from, as Debbie mentioned before, flyers or uh, customized web pages. Uh, we can help create things like posters or PowerPoint presentations um, and uh, provide photo galleries, uh, which are sometimes helpful if, um, if you have your own in-house uh, marketing team and, and just need photos to help promote your trip. Um, but yes, we can definitely help with designing those materials if you do not have uh, an in-house marketing team with your organization. And we can definitely uh, help uh, follow your your organization's branding guidelines if that's something that you're concerned about. Great, thanks, Lindsay. That also yourself. I wanted to say, sorry, uh, sorry, I was just going to throw in that um, for social media, back to social media and getting Holbrook assistance, we have had organizations um, request assistance with doing a webinar like the one you're attending now that helps reach out to people who might be interested just like we're doing and explain the trip and what to expect and so that's always a possibility to cover the social media and to cover what Hober can assist with we have lots of slides from past programs and destinations we can put PowerPoints um, together I work with a lot of schools we do mini posters to put up um, that can be done in community centers, um, you know, offices, anywhere at the church. So we can help create all those materials to get out 
so people can see the trip and learn about what what you're doing and what you're offering and just get out into the community and into people's um, faces so they know that there is a trip and you know and if not that particular trip then maybe they'll see that you're doing something exciting and you know ask for more information for the next time it's a matter of just getting it out there great um, to turn it around a little bit uh, to talk a little bit about what it's like to go in the field. Um, obviously, you always hope that your travel programs go smoothly, um, but have you ever had to deal with, I guess I'll ask this question to either Debbie or Lisa uh, first, and then we can ask Ron as well. Um, have you ever had to deal with any serious incidents when you were traveling in the field or when you had a group traveling in the field? Um, and how do you handle those? Whose responsibility is it, for example, if there's a medical emergency or a medical incident, um, whose responsibility is it to stay with the participant? And uh, how, how do you kind of handle those types of uh, situations? Well, I can, um give my input on that. We have had it happen. I've had it happen on a program that I was on um, where someone um, got injured. And you know, it doesn't take much, including myself, to just step on a rock and twist your ankle or, you know, something as easy as that. And we do have um, protocols for incidents such as that. For one, the group would never be left alone. There would always be a local guide that stays with the group and then we make sure that someone is available to go with the participant to get medical attention. If the leader was injured, then we would definitely make sure that you had the local guide stay with your group. Um, you know, in the past we have, you know, assisted people with getting them to different appointments and made sure that they were taken care of and if they needed their airline ticket changed to go home and needed to be on the aisle because they had a cast or something. Those are all things that we work hard to take care of. Our in-country partners are experts at that as well and, you know, we've many times had our in-country partner go to the hospital with um, somebody that needed x-rays and just make sure if there's a language problem or a barrier we always make sure that that person is taken care of and they're never on their own. Great. So you work Ron, in partnership with your in-country guide as as the leader you work together. I mean if it makes sense that you stay with a group and your guide goes because of the language barrier goes to the hospital with the person. It's it, it's it's dynamic. It's it's definitely something that that you figure out on the ground but because of experience and lots of, of the protocols she mentioned um, it's it goes smoothly. So go ahead Ron. Sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. No that's right. Somebody was asking me a question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, Ron, you typically lead very active trips. Um, have you ever had uh, an experience like that in the field? Yes, I have. Um, I think if somebody is going to um, uh, lead adventure trips, uh, whether they be climbing, hiking, what have you, it might be important, as I have, to, to get a wilderness first responder certification so that you're uh, able to deal with emergencies on a trail. Um, when you're out in the wilderness, you don't have 911 to respond. So um, at least some, um, you know, extensive first aid training so that you know how to deal with these situations. Um, but I always uh, find that I have complete confidence in the in-country guide as well. And working together with that in-country guide, you can usually um, solve the problems. Um, and, you know, like anything, you have to be open and flexible. Um, things are going to happen. Not everything is going to go as smoothly as you'd like it to. So you have to be prepared uh, to handle the situation. And, um, and the more prepared you are, the calmer you will be, and the more um, professional you will be in dealing with these uh, situations. Great. Thank you. Um, Debbie, uh, briefly, can you talk about um, is there an average number or a minimum or maximum number of uh, travelers who can participate in a program? And can you also break it down by student groups versus uh, adult groups, uh, whether it's a birding group or a photography group? Um, is it different between student and adult groups as far as uh, average or minimum number of travelers needed? 
Well, I I personally think the type of travel that we do, you don't want to have gigantic groups. So generally, you know, 20 would be the major outside, I think, or 21. I think our student groups, we uh, offer a scenario of 21 with three free leaders. That's So that gives you the one to seven ratio. And we also, for the same student groups, offer a scenario of seven and one free. So with one one chaperone going, you could have seven students traveling. And we can slice and dice that however you like. But um, generally for uh, adult groups like birding or natural history, we usually do it based on 10 or on 8, depending on a group. If it's a if it's a birding group, at eight eight or ten is pretty much the ideal number. Um, natural history often we're doing it. Our pricing is based on twelve and one and fifty or and fifteen and one, you know, being the maximum of sixteen. So personally, I think that's just the most ideal size too for uh, the camaraderie of the group. Everyone gets to know each other, and it's not a, uh, you know, it's not such a big group that there's people that you, well, what was their name so um, you don't have to you know you know it's just it's much easier to keep it smaller and plus the the destinations where we go big groups aren't really it's not uh, it's very difficult to be walking along a trail and everyone being able to hear um, what what the guide is talking about because you're strung out for a long way sure um either for Lisa or Debbie, um, do you need to be affiliated with an organization uh, in order to be a group leader, uh, to, to be a travel group leader? No. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I go ahead. Saying no, and you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say definitely not. Um, we have, um, you know, Ron is, um, you know, the director of the Climb for Cancer Foundation, but, you know, doing the trip, is not a requirement that he do that. He, you know, could just as easily put together a group of friends that like to go hiking. Um, we work with individuals. I've worked with families who have wanted to take friends and family, and so they put together a trip. So it does not have to be affiliated with a school or an organization. It just takes a leader who has a desire to want to travel and lead a trip and also go for free and has the access to people that they know want to travel with them. So having the affiliation may help in some cases, but it is definitely not necessary at all. Great. Um, I think we have time for about two more questions. Um, before we wrap up, I would just like to reiterate that we will be sending out a replay uh, of the webinar today. So if you missed anything or if you have any additional questions, uh, we'll definitely be able to share those with uh, Debbie or Lisa or, or uh, be able to direct those questions to the best person to help you. So if, you're, if we didn't get to your question today, um, please know that uh, we can definitely um, reach out to you and, and answer you individually. Um, one question I'd like to ask for Ron, uh, being a group leader requires a lot of energy and charisma. What are some of your strategies for keeping up that kind of energy uh, without fatigue or frustration getting in the way? Well, um, I just, uh, I, you know, just try to keep uh, my health up um, and keep my energy up. But I think that the most important thing is your attitude. If you have a great attitude, you're looking forward to being with a group. You're looking forward to being in this exciting environment. Uh, it certainly helps you uh, in terms of having a high energy level. Um, I just love what I do uh, when I'm out there, and um, and I love you know experiencing even if it's uh, a trip that I've done many times, just experience it through the. Uh, the client's eyes and and um, proving to them that they have the ability to find another gear and and um, do things that they don't they don't think are possible. But um, but I keep myself in shape and and hope I'll be able to do this for a long long time. Great. Um, and then final question uh, also for you, Ron. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your first time as a group travel leader and uh, what kind of expectations you had going in and uh, how did it turn out? Boy, 
Um, that's a great question because um, my first uh, uh, experience as a group leader, uh, that was before my association with Holbrook, um, turned out to be a bit of a disaster because um, there was somebody that was supposed to go with me who uh, unfortunately left the company. Uh, so I had 22 people by myself on the Inca Trail in uh, Peru. And uh, 1 to 22 ratio when you have people that are inexperienced on a trail uh, and some very experienced was uh, very challenging. And that's why, I'm, why I said you have to be open and flexible um, in dealing with that. And that was the, the uh, time when I had somebody who was injured on the trail. So that um, exacerbated that situation. And, um, and it taught me, <laughs> it taught me how to, uh, to be patient and open and flexible and, um, and how to, um, to get across the, the point to, to groups that I take now that it's very important to work as a team um, instead of people on the trail on their own agenda. It's very important to keep a group uh, together as much as possible and, um, and all look after one another. So um, uh, I made it through that, but I learned a lot of lessons on that first day. <laughs> And um, do you have a favorite travel memory from uh, recent experiences? Well, um, gosh, a favorite travel memory. Um, I, I, I don't know if I could, you know, people ask me all the time, um, what, what's, your, what's your favorite experience? And, of course, the first thing they expect me to say is Everest, um, but, um, you know, which was an amazing experience. But... I just love being in these beautiful uh, wilderness locations like Patagonia and being with a group and letting them experience um, the, the, the beauty of this planet. And um, so I would say my favorite is my last one. Uh, it's always, <laughs> and, and I look forward to the next one. Uh, I just love all of the trips. Uh, I'm going to have the pleasure of going to... Uh, Ecuador and Amazon with a group uh, in May, and then to Galapagos, and then um, the Inca Trail again to Machu Picchu, and then Africa, and so, um, you know, it, it just doesn't get any better than that, and, and the last trip it was always my best trip. Great. Well, I think that's a, a great note to end on. Uh, thank you so much, Ron, for joining us today and for sharing your experiences. And uh, thank you also to Debbie and Lisa for joining us and sharing your experiences. Um, we really enjoyed having all three of you as panelists today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, with that, we conclude our webinar today. Uh, again, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us and sharing their expertise, and also thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, we hope you found the presentation interesting and informative. Uh, the webinar today has been recorded, and we'll be emailing everyone a replay uh, later this week. Uh, so thank you again, and have a great rest of your afternoon.